are finishing up our series called The Comparison Trap. And so we're going to finish it up this week. I'm pretty pumped about finishing it. Hey, just like when we started this series, we started with a truth that was a little bit uncomfortable. Can I end with a truth that's a little bit uncomfortable? But here's the truth that we started with week one that was a little bit uncomfortable. It goes something like this. Comparison is a trap that robs our joy and ruins our relationship. And here's why, like, it's uncomfortable. Because listen, if you were honest, if I were honest, if we were all honest, right? Like, comparing is normal. Like, it seems like comparison is something we do every day, all the time, everywhere we go. Comparison feels so natural. How could comparison, because it feels so normal and feels so natural, be wrong? And every week I've tried to say, listen, science has confirmed what God has been telling us, that comparison is a trap and it robs our joy and ruins our relationship. Matter of fact, in my research, I came across this article earlier, but I wanted to share it with you as I close, because I just want you to go, hey, this just isn't a pastor's idea. It's not just my idea. The science kind of backs it up. So I'm going to read a little bit from this article. It says, listen, I've seen this happen countless times in my therapy often. office. Clients feel as though they are not measuring up life because they can't compete with their friends or their coworkers. They look around and go, man, I just can't keep up with all my friends and people. Soon they grow consumed with hostility because they feel like they're not getting their fair share. I'm telling you, how many of us go through life and we go, I'm not getting my fair share? Social media seems to amplify the resentment. And it goes on to say, spend two minutes scrolling through Facebook and it's easy to become convinced that your friends are happier, your friends are healthier, and your friends are wealthier as they post their pictures of their latest vacation photos and announce their good fortune, right? But studies show that envying your friends on social media leads to depression. It's not my idea. It's not just some, you know, old thing that God said. Like science has confirmed that like, listen, when we envy our friends on social media, it gets us depressed. And listen, whether you envy a coworker who got a promotion or resentful that your boss drives a car you can't afford, resenting other people's success is it wasn't a trick quite bad. It's bad for, it's bad for you. Now, what is it like? How is it bad for you? And I want to kind of go on to what it says is bad for you. It's bad for your health. I mean, week one we talked about, like, listen, this has physical consequences. Not only is it bad for your health, it's bad for your relationships. It's bad for your career. It'll drain your mental strength. It'll hold you back from reaching your greatest potential. It's bad for your health. It's bad for your relationships. It doesn't help you. And is this some Christian author? Is this some pastor who did a message? No, Forbes Business Magazine, January of 2000. 17. Which leads us to, why is it so bad? Well, because comparison leads to behaviors that harm us and ourselves. Matter of fact, week one, we said, listen, here's what comparison leads to. Competing. Instead of being a friend that is for you, we become enemies that we need to beat each other. And so it leads to competing. And week one, we discovered, listen, listen, greatness isn't defined by how many people you beat. Jesus said greatness is defined by how you love people. And so instead of competing, we can actually celebrate others. Week two, we talked about coveting. You see something somebody has and you want, I desire, and I wish, right? But here's what we discovered week two, week two, or week three, we discovered, listen, that you'll never be satisfied. You can't consume your way to happiness because you were made for purpose. And so you can't covet, we should be content. And then we said week four, we said, listen, in America, we're like, we could get a gold medal in complaining. It's never enough, we're never satisfied right? It's just never good enough when we can complain. But here's the problem with complaining. It harms us physically. It harms us emotionally and it harms us spiritually. We discovered this last week. And really, we don't know what someone else is paying for to have what it is that they have. And so we really should just practice gratitude. And then comparison leads to chasing. It's where we chase the applause of the wrong audience. And you might be going, well, Matt, how, how do we like chase the applause of the wrong audience? And, and it got me thinking, now, I'm about to put a statement up here. Don't put up it just yet, but I'm about to put a statement up that we all know, we've all experienced, but we never, ever say this truth out loud. Ready? We're going to put it up here because we've all experienced it, right? We're going to put it up right here. The success of others often makes us feel less valuable. Am I the only one? Liars. <laughs> Like, come on, kid, let's, let's, let's be honest, let's, let's be honest. Come on, how many of you, like, you have a friend from high school or a friend from college, right? And they post on Facebook, they've went on a diet, they're exercising, and they look all fit and buff. And you're like, man, why, why, why don't I look like that anymore? Look at them, they're doing such a great job. How many of you have heard about a friend who's having a party because they got a promotion? And you go, why aren't I succeeding in life. You get invited to a housewarming party for someone who has bought a brand new house and you go, well, why is my house not new and why do they have the things that I have? You see someone talking about their kid, their kid does this and their kid does this and their kid is great because every kid is special and they all are, right? 
and you go, why am I not a better parent? And it's because, listen, listen, the success of others often makes us feel like someone's pushing us down. This is a true story, and I always hate sharing true stories about myself, but I've always been honest that I'm mostly a moron, right? And so I don't mind. I'll just be honest with you, right? Now, listen, I know this is going to come a little bit of a shock to you, but my, my hobby is powerlifting. Now, God made me to be a cross-country runner, not a powerlifter, but I want to powerlift. It's what I like to do, and so I've been training, and, and I was supposed to have this powerlifting competition in August, and because of my schedule, and because of life, and because of my family, and I, I really didn't get to compete in this powerlifting contest. Um, so I went to the gym and I kind of did all my lifts kind of in the gym with the spotter to see what I could do. And, and it wasn't everything that I wish I could do, but it wasn't a bad total. So I was pretty pumped. But then the following week, I ran into my friend who did get to compete in, in the powerlifting meet. And I asked him about his total. Now, this is where I should tell you that as a pastor and as a follower of Jesus, I was like, man, I hope he did better than me. But that's not what happened. What I was secretly hoping was that all my lifts would be his lifts. But as he told me his totals, like on the outside, I was going, hooray, I high fived and I congratulated. Like I was a good dude. Like I was like, hey, I'm, we've been lifting partners. So I was like cheering for him and man, that's awesome. But all of his lifts were better than mine. And on the inside, I was dying and I go, why do I stink? Why did God make me this way? Because success of others often makes us feel less valuable. I mean, it's, it's something that we've all experienced. And here's the thing, listen, you've experienced it, I've experienced it, we've experienced it. Matter of fact, humans on every century, on every con, in every culture have experienced it. And listen, before social science told us about this, God's been telling us about this. Matter of fact, one of the wisest guys ever to live, his name was King Solomon. He wrote a bunch of literature. He had a kingdom. He owned a bunch of stuff. He built a bunch of stuff. One of the wisest people to ever walk the earth, God spoke to him. And he talked about this very issue. Matter of fact, we're going to pick up what King Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. We're going to put it on the screen. He says this. Then I observed that most people, not all people, but a majority of people, 99% of people are motivated to because they envy their neighbors. But this too is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. And so what one of the wisest men to ever walk the planet says, listen, here's what I see. Because he experienced it, he saw the people who said, he says, listen, we are motivated to success by our envy or by comparing to others. And we all go, yeah, we see that every day. But the problem is the wisest guy says it is meaningless, it is like chasing the wind, that when we are motivated to succeed by envy, it has a fatal flaw. And here's why it has a fatal flaw. My friend, I'm going to put this up on the screen for you. When our success is tied to our value, there's a problem. I mean, and that's how we work here in America, right? Here in America, here in the Western Coast. As a matter of fact, almost everywhere in the world, our value is to tied to, to how successful we are. So if you're somebody who's very successful, then you are extremely valuable, right? If you're a mostly successful person, you're very valuable. And you know, if you have some successes and some losses, then you're somewhat valuable. And if you seem to lose more than win, then you have a little bit of value in it. If you seem to mostly lose and not really win, well, then you have no value. And this is where it is meaningless. Here's where it's chasing the win. And here's the fatal flaw of your value being tied to success. And we're going to put up here on the screen. Is that regardless of where you think you fall on this, it represents a person. A person who has a story. A person who matters deeply to the heart of God. It's why our core value number two is everyone is loved and welcomed. Which leads us to something that we all know is that when our success is tied to our value, something happens. Because listen, listen, listen. When someone else is successful and they feel like we're push, they're pushing us down and we're down a ladder, we're going to go, no, 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 no. No one's going to tell me that I'm not valuable. And something happens inside of us and we're going to fight or flight and we're going to do something. We're not going to have our value robbed by somebody else's success. So we're going to strive and we're going to do things. The problem with this is it leads to a behavior. And here's the behavior it leads to. If our value comes from success, then we have permission to act however we want to succeed. Right, if my value comes from success, and if you're more successful and that makes me less value and I'm on the bottom of the food chain, then I have permission. I have permission to gossip about her. I have permission to cheat him. I have permission in business to take shortcuts. And here's why I have permission to do that is because my value comes from success and I can't let people push me down. And this is how the world operates. When success is tied to our value, 
But then it gives us permission to do things that we know make the world wrong. And it's what leads me to our opening truth. If you're one of those people who are following along type A, you wanna get all the insert right, it's on your insert, we're gonna put it up on the screen, it goes like this. Chasing value through success creates the inhumanity, we, inhumanity that we despise. What's wrong with the world? It's the way we treat each other, right? It's not economics, it's not politics, it's not anything else, it's how we treat each other. What's wrong with the world is that we treat each other inhumanely. What is busted and broken is the way that we treat people in the world. But if our value is tied to success, then it leads to the very thing that we hate. Because if my value comes from success, then listen to this. My goal in life is to beat you, not to be the best me. Do you see the difference? My goal in life is to beat other people, not to be the best me. And the world becomes a cold and it becomes a dark place where value is only determined by how much success an individual has. Now, as we talk about this, you might be going, man, I think this pastor is against success. And you might be going, Are, do you, is success bad? Is God against success? And the answer is no, right? God's not against success. I'm not against success. But if we get our value from success, we need to ask an important question. Matter of fact, so that we don't fall into this trap in comparison, we need to ask an important question that needs to be answered today. If you're following along in your insert, we're going to put it up on the screen, and it's this. What is true success? I mean, what is true success? I mean, in the news lately, in the last year, the last couple years, we've seen notable people who look like they were successful, then their private life comes out into the open, and we don't consider them successful anymore because their private life came out, and we realized how they got there, what they did along the way, we would not consider a success. So someone has to define what true success looks like. So we need to ask a question, well, who defines success? Why do we want success? And then how do we achieve it? And when we answer these three questions, we'll be able to really kind of answer the question, well, what is true success? Because if it's tied to our value, then it leads to the inhumanity that we don't like, that we're actually against. How do we get away from this meaningless, this chasing the wind? And it starts off by asking this question, who defines it? So who defines success? And listen, since the beginning of time, listen, I know most of you think that it started in middle school. It started way before middle school, right? Most of us are trying to forget middle school, except you real cool, popular people that were in middle school, right? But the rest of us, we're trying to forget middle school, right? But listen, from the beginning of time, the crowd has always determined what success looks like. And here's what the crowd, since the beginning of time, has always said success looks like. It's your position. Do you have a position with power? And the more power you have, the better position it is. And if you have a position with lots of power, then man, you are successful. If you have money and wealth and prosperity, then you are successful. If you have the access to pleasure and fun things and good things and food and all these other things, then you are successful. And so how we measure success in the Western culture, how we've measured success since the beginning of time, the crowd has said around you, do you want to be successful? Well, you have a position that has power, have wealth and prosperity and be able to access pleasures. And this is success. Now, God spells success with four letters, L-O-V-E, love. And we're gonna come back to the difference between those two things in a second. But before we do, I wanna, I wanna warn you because listen, I'm about to say something. As I was preparing this message, I got really offended. And so, and here's why I got really offended because Jesus offended the Pharisees. And when he said this, they got really offended and it was really hard. So I just need you to buckle up, bing, right? I'm about to say something that might offend you. You see, we all like this. Everybody wants a position of power. Everybody wants prosperity. Everybody wants pleasures. And so here's what happens. And here's what made the Pharisees so mad that they wanted to kill Jesus. See, the Pharisees saw this list and they said, man, that looks pretty good, but we're like supposed to follow God. And they said, you know what we'll do? Instead of getting rid of this list, we'll just add God on the front of the list. Like, because I'm with God, he will give me a good position. Because I'm with God, he's going to give me prosperity. And because I'm with God, he's going to give me all the pleasures I want. And this is what it looks like. And here's the thing about the Pharisees. I mean, they had the perfect picture. They were patriots of their country. They were, they were wealthy and they were moral. And they said, listen, this is what success looks like. You, you, you know, God gives you a position, God gives you prosperity, and God gives you pleasure. And then Jesus shows up in the scene and says, you've got it wrong. Success is not measured by your position, your prosperity, or your pleasure. 
Matter of fact, Jesus showed up in the world and said, world, you've got it wrong. The reason that you have inhumanity is you believe this is success. And you want to say, well, what did Jesus say success was? Well, he tells us in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Matthew, this guy who saw Jesus risen from the dead, he didn't follow his teachings, he followed a risen Christ. And here's what he records the words of Jesus. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Jesus said, do you want to know what success looks like? It looks like loving God. But then Jesus doesn't stop there because, you know, religious people and, and weird people and Christians, they get it kind of messed up just thinking this way. So Jesus wants to make sure you don't mess up. He says, and the second is equally important, love your neighbor as... Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and the demands of the prophet are based upon these two things. And he looked at the Pharisees and he told them something that they didn't want to hear. He said, listen, prosperity, position, and pleasure are gifts of God. They're not inherently wrong or bad, but they're in poor measures of success. You are not successful because you have position. You're not successful because you have pleasures. You're not successful because you have prosperity. Jesus said success is measured by how you love God and how you love people. And here's where I just need to add a side note. Listen, listen, this is where the church really needs to get. Listen, you can't say that you love God and then treat people poorly. Because if you love God, then you have to love people. Jesus said, listen, you want to know what success looks like? Love God with all your heart and soul and neighbor and then love your neighbor as yourself. So we have to ask, who defines success for you? Who defines success for me? Who defines success for us? Is it the crowd? Do we think success really does boil down to our position and our prosperity and our ability to experience pleasure? Or does God define success as loving him and loving others? Which leads us directly into the second part of the question of what true success is, is, is why do we want it? You know, why do we want success in the first place? And listen, as I began to prepare and walk through this, I was like, this message isn't for you, it's for me. I said, you're just right here, you're just in my business today. This is so hard because if we're really honest, there's usually two reasons we want to succeed and it really only boils down to two reasons. One is we want to get honor for ourselves. We want the world to go, look at me. Look how awesome I am. Everyone tell me how great and wonderful I am, right? I mean, that's why we want to succeed. We want people to notice. We want people to go, you are awesome. And so we want to get honor. But there's another reason that we could want to succeed, and it's to give honor to God. To go, listen, God made me. He gave me some talents. He, he gave his son to die on the cross, and I want to honor him. And so that my success is not about everyone look at me. It's about giving my best to God. And, I, and you can answer this really easily. Is your goal to be better than someone, or is it to be the best you? See, when we ask the question, why do we want success? Why do is it that we want to do whatever it is that we want to do? Are we really trying to just be the best me? Or are we trying to be better to someone? Are we saying my value comes from me going, look, I'm better than them. I'm better than that person. I'm, I'm more talented. I have, I have, I'm more than this. I have more. Like, are we using each other's evaluation by putting others down? Why do we want it? And Jesus addresses this with the Pharisees. He looks at the religious crowd and he says, listen, you, 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 can't, you can't say true success is about getting honor for yourself. You really should honor God. Matter of fact, this is what Jesus says. We're going to put it up here in John 5, 41 through 44. He says, your approval means nothing. Isn't it true that so many times that we want approval from people who wouldn't spit in our ear if our brains were on fire? I mean, think about it. You want your 15 minutes of fame from the mob who will turn on you in a second. We want everyone to say you're the latest and greatest until you're not. Jesus said, listen, I'm not looking for your approval. I realize that you can't give me the approval that I'm looking for. I know that you don't have God's love within you. And he goes on to continue. For I've come to you in my Father's name and you have rejected me. Yet if others come in their own name, you gladly welcome them. He's saying, listen, I'm confused. You honor each other, but you don't honor the creator who made you. And he goes on to say this. No wonder you can't believe, for you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. Jesus reminds me, he says, listen, you're playing to the wrong audience. 
He says, don't you get it? When you stand before your maker, listen, 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 listen. I know we all come from different backgrounds. I know there's some people here who maybe have no faith. Some people came from different faiths. Some people maybe grew up in church. I know we all have maybe different viewpoints, but since Jesus conquered hell and death, I trust him. Since he's the only one that said that he would die and then actually came back to life and said he was gonna come back to life, I trust him. And Jesus says something pretty important. He says, listen, you're gonna stand before your maker and you and I are gonna give an account for the life that we've lived. Now that doesn't get us into heaven or send us to hell. I mean, we get to heaven because of what Jesus did. It's by grace and grace alone. But all of us are going to be held accountable for how we used our life. And your best bud, your Instagram account and Instagram followers aren't going to be there. It's going to be you and God. And how bad of a pastor would I be if I said, oh, just, you know, just make each other happy. Jesus, no, you're going to answer to the one who alone is God. So if you want to know what true success is, you, you've got to ask the question, why is it that I want to succeed? Is it to bring honor to myself or is it to be the best that God made me to bring honor to him? And then lastly, it's, it's how do I achieve it? How do we achieve success? And the reality is, is if our value, listen, listen, you get this and I get this. Listen, if our value is tied to our success, success in any means necessary, because listen, no one's going to rob me from my value. I want to have value. You want to have value. So if I'm going to have value, then any means is necessary. It means I get to do whatever it is that I want to do because I need to be successful so I can, I can take shortcuts. I can do things that aren't necessarily right. I can do wrong to end up right. We see this in business. We see this in relationships. We see this in every aspect of life where people say the ends justify the means because our value is tied directly to our success. But if our value isn't tied to our success, then as integrity allows. There was this guy, his name was David. He was a shepherd and then he eventually became a king. But before he became a king, God had promised to become a king and the current king kind of chased King David around and King David was hiding in the cave and this other king, King Saul, who wanted to kill him, came to the cave and all of his buds said, King David, the dude is here that's trying to chase you. You should kill him. And here's how he responded first Samuel. I believe this is God speaking to us. He says, as the old proverb says, from evil people come evil deeds. Here's a true statement. You'll never end up in the right place using wrong methods. Or you'll never be right doing wrong. I'll never forget when my adopted dad, when he took me in, he said something, it was, it was really so simple and so easy, but so hard. He said, son, and I said, yes, dad. He said, look me in the eye, and I said, look me in the eye. He looked at me and said, son, right will always be right, and wrong will always be. And see, when our value is tied to success, then any means is necessary because my value is tied to that. And I want to be more valuable. And the more valuable I am, that means I should be able to do whatever it is I need to do to uh, do that. But if our value is not tied, then only as integrity allows. Which leads us into a second question, which is who's our audience? Who's my audience? Whose applause as we go through life are you and I seeking? When you and I are seeking the crowd's approval, it is called king of the hill, <laughs> right? When you and I are looking for the crowd, it's as we go through life, we want to get to the top ladder, but so does everybody else. Everybody else is trying to get the top ladder. Everyone else is trying to be popular. Everyone else is trying to succeed. Everyone else wants to be seen. Everybody else wants praises. So it's this giant race and everyone is like stepping on each other. They're pushing each other. I mean, anybody here play king of the hill? Okay, this example will work really great if three people raise their hand. You guys really need to get out more often if you've never played King of the Hill. Hey, a couple years ago, it's probably four or five years ago here in St. Mary's, um, we had this giant snowstorm. It snowed for like two days straight. It was, just, it was just snow, snow, lots of snow. I think we got like three, three and a half feet of snow here in the area. And I live in Leonardtown proper and they cleaned all the snow out and they were, they were moving it all out and they had to move all the snow somewhere and they moved it to this giant pile. And then one day, my daughters and I, and they were all bundled up, they did these hood things and they were all puffy, look like little snowmen right there out there walking. And it's my wife and I, and we were all walking, there's this giant pile of snow. And we saw this giant pile of snow and we started climbing up it and having fun and laughing. And then when we got to the top, we decided we were going to play King of the Hill. And it was a blast for me because I'm bigger and stronger than everyone in my family. So I just face palm and all the crowds get down. <laughs> yes. And they may make me a bad person. I'm sorry. I was having a blast, right? Pushing them down. And you know what? I'm not a bad dad. So I'd let them pull me down and, you know, I'd let them pull me down and they'd get to the top and they'd go, I'm king of the hill. And they would try to do it. And then the, the, the girls would realize that if they teamed up, they could do better. And it was just, it was a fun experience. 
And that's okay to play King of the Hill with your kids when they're four and five. It's a whole different thing to live life. Where our whole goal is to make sure that we push others down. Because here's the truth. If our value is tied to success, then the only way to increase our value is for someone else to be less. If our value is tied to success, the only way to have more value is to make someone else have less value. The very thing that we hate about the world. And when our audience is the crowd, we want to be at the top so everyone can look at us. But to get to the top, people aren't things that we love and things are things that we use. We use people and love things. And we just kick and we push and we, pro and we climb. And we end up with the kind of world that we live in today that we don't like. Now, when God's our audience, we are our brother's keeper. I mean, Jesus said, if you want to fulfill the whole law, love God. And he said, it's not complicated. Like, I don't know how many sermons I need to give. Like, I literally think I could show up every Sunday and go, love your neighbor. Amen. I mean, I don't know what else there is. I mean, like there's six or seven topics that the Bible covers repeatedly over and over. It's not complicated, right? We're to be a keeper of other people, not in an unhealthy, dysfunctional, do it for them way, do things that they should do for themselves. No, no, no. But listen, all of us are going to face times in our life that are overwhelming, that we can barely hold on, that we can barely make where other people should step into our lives and not push us down so that they can feel good, but that they would lift us up and that they would be our keepers and our partners. That's why we value small groups. That's why we say at South Point, it's our core value. Number four, life is better together. We are supposed to be the keeper of others. I love what the apostle Paul says. There was this guy, his name was Saul, right? And he's, he was this religious guy and he didn't really like Christians and he used to persecute him. And he didn't become a follower of Jesus because the teachings of Jesus were so great. He became a follower of Jesus because he encountered a risen Christ and he planted a church in Galatia. And it was a group a lot like this. Some people had no faith. Some people had different faith. Some people who had grown up in church. And he, and he wrote him this thing. I'm gonna put up here on the screen. Here's what he said in Galatians. He said this. No, uh, did I miss a verse in there? Yes, he goes, obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. You see, it's amazing to me that when you're Christ's servant, it usually looks very different to success to other people. People are like, why are you nice? I can't tell you the number of people when I go, hey, how's your day? I go, it's better than I deserve. They're like, wow, that's a really unique. I'm like, man, I woke up on the right side of grass, man. It's a good day, man. You know, and they, and they seem all like weirded out. And, and when you're nice to people, they're like, what, why are you nice? Are you, something wrong with you? You know, like, are you a pastor? I'm like, yes. And they instantly call me a pastor just because I'm nice. I'm like, what is wrong with the world when you're nice to another human being that they instantly associate you? And it's because of this. When you're not trying to win the approval of others, they will notice something different. You, you can't choose the crowd and God. And, and, and this is what's really hard. Like, it's just really hard. None of us like it. I don't like it. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just trying to be honest. You can't try to win the approval of the crowd and God. You'll either win the applause of one or the applause of the other. So we're left with a pretty tricky question, which is, well, how do I make a difference, right? I mean, it's kind of the question number three, which is, how can I make a difference? Because one of the reasons that we're here today, one of the reasons that we love movies, one of the reasons that we love books, one of the reasons we love stories, one of the reasons that we actually attempt to do anything is we want our life to make a difference. Every single person in this room says, I want my life to count, and that is a good thing. And the question is, well, how can I make a difference? And you can call it success, you can call it significance, I don't care the title, but the real question is, how does my life make a difference? Now, as a pastor, I unfortunately have the privilege of doing funerals. And you might be going, well, why is that a privilege? Isn't it sad? And I go, yes, it is. But you know what I've noticed about funerals? Is funerals always reveal what's really important in life. Because at funerals, no one ever goes, man, did you see that fly car that that person used to have? Man, that person lived in the prettiest house. Man, the person we're burying, did you know they had a big bank account? Man, the person we buried, they got to go to all the cool parties. No, at funerals, they don't talk about those things. You want to know what they talk about at funerals? Relationships. What kind of mother, what kind of husband, 
What kind of brother? What kind of sister? What kind of friend? At the end of the day, we all really know what life is about. And this apostle Paul, who became a Christ follower, writes this. He says, you want to know how you can make a difference? He said, carry each other's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. When you and I care for those, when we love people around us, we fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they are deceiving themselves. As human beings, none of us are human doings. What matters are people. And if we're so important that we can't help people, we've deceived ourselves. He goes on to say this, each one should test their own actions, then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. Listen, God created a story that only you can live out. God created a story for me that only I can live out. I can't live your story, you can't live my story, so can we stop judging each other off of our stories? It's not about beating or being better. It's about doing the best that I can to honor God. When I love him and then I love others, that is the definition of success. If it was hot in this auditorium and my timer told me I was almost done, which all of these are true, and I was going to sum up this message, I would sum it up this way. Our unshakable value allows us to share compassion in a world that is in desperate need. We live in a world in desperate need of compassion. You might be saying, what is this unshakable value? There's a God who died for you. You see, here's the greatest news to ever hit planet Earth. Your value, my value, our value does not come from what we did, done, or will do. You know what our value comes from? Who loves us. You see, the God and the creator of the universe loved you you. And I know that some of you in this room are thinking, Matt, you don't know what I've done. And you're right, I don't. But I know that there's no sin that the blood of Jesus can't forgive. And that God sent his son to call everyone home, to call them sons and daughters. That you are not forsaken, that you are chosen in Christ. God couldn't love you any more than he already does. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God found in Jesus. And that value that God already loves me as much as he can means I don't have to be a people pleaser. I can get up here and just say the truth whether you like it or not. It means we can unleash compassion in an inhumane world instead of chasing up the ladder and pushing people down because your value and my value and our value does not come from success. It comes from the fact that there's a God who made us, a God who loves us, and a God who calls us to be his friend. I want to close out this series the same way I started with one slide, and it's this one. Comparison. I would be lying to you if I got up here and said, listen, as a follower of Jesus, you're never going to compare. Because that's not true. You're going to compare this message to last week's message or to whoever your favorite person is. You're going to compare your car when you get out. You're going to compare the service you get. Like, we're all going to compare. Like, comparing is something that we just do. It just happens in life. But it's not do we compare, it's what happens when we compare that makes it good or bad. And so when you and I face comparison, we have some options. We can fall into the trap where we're going to compete. And you're not going to be my friend that I'm for, you're going to be an enemy that I beat. We can covet, I want, I need, I deserve, I desire. But you'll never consume your way to happen. So I'm going to complain, which just makes us sadder and it's harder on our physical system. It's just never good enough. Or we could chase the applause of the audience who won't be there when we stand before our creator. Or we can celebrate others when they do well and they have success and realize that their success doesn't diminish me. I don't need to have what you have. I don't know what you have, if that's what you want or if it works. All I know is I can be content knowing that I have purpose and that fulfillment doesn't come from consumption. Instead of complaining, I can be thankful for what I do have and where God loves me and died for me. Instead of chasing the ladder and living a king of the hill lifestyle, I can choose to love my neighbor and treat them as I would want to be treated and provide compassion. Comparison's going to happen. We have two options. One will rob your joy and ruin your relationships. The other leads to the life that Jesus died for us to have. My hope and my prayer 
is that you and I would choose wisely and that none of us would fall into the comparison trap. Let me pray. Hey God, thank you. Thank you that before social science came out and told us comparison is crazy and that envy and jealousy destroy our lives, you've been saying it from the beginning. And God, wherever we have played king of the hill, wherever we have coveted and competed and chased and complained, God, there is mercy and grace found not in a religion or organization, but in a person named Jesus. So God, as we go through life and comparison happens, God, help us not fall in the trap. Help us to do the things that you told us to do, to be content, to celebrate, to have gratitude, and to unleash compassion. God, help us to know that our value doesn't come from our money, from our pleasures, or from our position, but our value comes that you loved us and that you sent your only son to die for us. God, speak to our hearts. God, meet us where we're at. Help us to not fall into this trap. We seek you, love you, and thank you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.